Hey, welcome back. Continue on with the War of Arts. Resistance and Criticism. If you find yourself critic criticizing other people, you're probably doing it out of resistance. When we see others beginning to live their authentic selves, it drives us crazy if we have not lived out our own. Individuals who are realized in their own lives almost never criticize others. If they speak at all, it is to offer encouragement. Watch yourself. Of all the manifestations of resistance, most only harm ourselves. Criticism and cruelty harm others as well. Self-doubt can be an ally. This is because it serves as an indicator of aspiration. It reflects love. Love of something we dream of doing and desire. Desire to do it. If you find yourself asking yourself and your friends, am I really a writer? Am I really an artist? Chances are, you are. The counterfeit innovator is wildly self-confident. The real one is scared to death. Resistance and fear. Are you paralyzed with fear? That's a good sign. Fear is good. Like self-doubt, fear is an indicator. Fear tells us what we have to do. Remember our rule of thumb? The more scared we are of of a work or calling, the more sure we can be that we have to do it. Resistance is experienced as fear. The degree of fear equates to the strength of resistance. Therefore, the more fear we feel about a specific enterprise, the more certain we can be that that enterprise is important to us and to the growth of our soul. That's why we feel so much resistance. If it meant nothing to us, there'd be no resistance. Have you ever watched Inside the Actor's Studio? The host, James Lipton, invariably asks his guest, What factors made you decide to take a particular role? The actor always answers, Because I'm afraid of it. The professional tackles a project that will make him stretch. He takes on the assignment that will bear him into uncharted waters compel him to explore unconscious parts of himself. Is he scared? Hell yes, he's petrified. Conversely, the professional turns down roles that he's done before. He's not afraid of them anymore. Why waste his time? So if you're paralyzed with fear, it's a good sign. It's a good sign. It shows what you have to do. Resistance and love. Resistance is directly proportional to love. If you're feeling massive resistance, the good news is, it means there's tremendous love there too. If you didn't love the project that is terrifying you, you wouldn't feel anything. The opposite of love isn't hate, it's indifference. The more resistance you experience, the more important your sorry, the more resistance you experience, the more important your unmanifested art project or enterprise is to you and the more gratification you will feel when you finally do it. Resistance and being a star. Grandiose fantasies are a symptom of resistance. They're a sign of an amateur. The professional has learned that success, like happiness, comes as a byproduct of work. The professional concentrates on the work and allows rewards to come or not to come, whatever they like. Resistance and isolation. Sometimes we balk at embarking on an empty, on an enter Sometimes we balk at embarking on an enterprise because we're afraid of being alone. We feel comfortable with the tribe around us. It makes us nervous going off into the woods on our own. Here's the trick: we're never alone. As soon as we step outside the campfire glow, our muse lights on our shoulder like a butterfly. The act of courage calls forth infallibly the deeper part of ourselves that supports and sustains us. Have you seen interviews with the young John Lennon or Bob Dylan? When the reporter tries to ask about their personal selves, the boys deflect these queries with withering sarcasm. Why? Because Lennon and Dylan know that the part of them that writes the songs is not them, not the personal self that is of self that is of such surpassing fascination to their boneheaded interrogators. 
Lennon and Dylan also know that the part of themselves that does the writing is too scared, too precious, too fragile to be redacted into sound bites for the titillation of would-be idolaters, who are themselves caught up by their own resistance. So they put them on and blow them off. It is a commonplace among artists and children at play that they're not aware of time or solitude while they're chasing their vision. The hours fly. The sculptress and the tree climbing tyke both look up, blinking when mum calls, supper time. Resistance and Isolation Part 2 Friends sometimes ask, don't you get lonely sitting by yourself all day? At first, it seemed odd to hear myself answer no. Then I realised I was not alone. I was in the book. I was with the characters. I was with myself. Not only do I feel, not only do I not feel alone with my characters, they are more vivid and interesting to me than the people in my real life. If you think about it, the case can't be otherwise. In order for a book or any project or enterprise to hold our attention for the length of time it takes to unfold itself, it has to plug into some internal perplexity or passion that is of paramount importance to us. The problem becomes the theme of our work. Even if, even if we can't, at the start, understand or articulate it. As the characters arise, each embodies infallibly an aspect of that dilemma, that perplexity. These characters might not be interesting to anyone else, but they're absolutely fascinating to us. They are us. Meaner, smarter, sexier versions of ourselves. It's fun to be with them because they're wrestling with the same issues, the same issue that has his hooks into us. They're our soul mates, our lovers, our best friends, even the villains, especially the villains. Even, if a, even in a book like this, which has no characters, I don't feel alone because I'm imagining the reader whom I conjure as an aspiring artist, much like my younger, less grizzled self to whom I hope to impart a little starch and inspiration and prime, and little, with some hard knocks, wisdom, and a few tricks of the trade. Resistance and healing. Have you ever spent time in Santa Fe? There's a subculture of healing there. The idea is that there's something therapeutic in the atmosphere, a safe place to go to get yourself together. There are other places, Santa Barbara and OJ, California come to mind, usually populated by upper middle class people with more time and money than they know what to do with, in which a culture of healing also obtains. The concept in all these environments seems to be that one needs to complete this his healing before he is ready to do his work. This way of thinking, are you ahead of me, is a form of resistance. What are we trying to heal anyway? The athlete knows the day will never come when he wakes up pain-free. He has to play hurt. Remember, the part of us that we imagine needs healing is not the part we create from. That part is far deeper and stronger. The part we create from can't be touched by anything our parents did or society did. The part is unsullied, uncorrupted, soundproof, waterproof and bulletproof. In fact, the more troubles we've got, the better and richer that part becomes. The part that needs healing is our profession, personal life. Personal life has nothing to do with work. Besides, what better way of healing than to find our center of self-sovereignty? Isn't that the whole point of healing? I washed up in New York a couple of decades ago, making 20 bucks a night driving a cab and running away full-time from doing my own work. One night, Alone in my $110 a month sublet, I hit bottom in terms of having diverted myself into so many phony channels, so many times that I couldn't rationalize it for one more evening. I dragged out my ancient Smith Corona, dreading the experience as pointless, fruitless, meaningless. Not to say that the most painful exercise I could think of. For the next two hours, I made myself sit there, torturing out some trash that I chunked immediately into the shit can. That was enough. I put the machine away. I went back to the kitchen. I, in the sink sat 10 days of dishes. For some reason, I had enough excess energy that I decided to wash them. The warm water felt pretty good. 
The soap and the sponge were doing their thing. A pile of clean plates began rising in the drying rack. To my amazement, I realized I was whistling. It hit me that I turned a corner. I was okay. I would be okay from here on. Do you understand? I hadn't written anything good. It might be years before I would, if I ever did at all. What didn't matter... Oh, sorry, that didn't matter. What counted was that I had, after years of running, running from it, actually sat down and done my work. Don't get me wrong, I've got nothing against true healing. We all need it. But has not, it has nothing to do with doing our own work. And it can be a colossal exercise in resistance. Resistance loves healing. Resistance knows that the more psychic energy we expend, dredging and redredging the tired, boring injustices of our personal lives, the less juice we have to do our work. Resistance and support. Have you ever been to a workshop? These boondoggles are colleagues of resistance. They ought to give out PhDs in resistance. What better way of avoiding work than going to a workshop? But what I hate even worse, even worse is the word support. Seeking support from friends and family is like having your people gathered around at your deathbed. It's nice, but when the ship sails, all they can do is stand on the dock waving goodbye. Any support we get from persons of flesh and blood is like monopoly money. It's not legal tender in that sphere where we have to do our work. In fact, the more energy we expend stoking up on support, sorry, stocking up, on support from our colleagues and loved ones, the weaker we become and the less capable of handling our business. My friend Carol had the following dream at a time when she felt her life felt like it was careening out of control. She was a passenger on a bus. Bruce Springsteen, Bruce Springsteen was driving. Suddenly, Springsteen pulled over, handed Carol the, Carol the keys and bolted. In the dream, Carol was panicking. How could she drive this huge rolling greyhound? By now, all the passengers were staring. Clearly, no one else was going to step forward and take charge. Carol took the wheel. To her amazement, she found she could handle it. Later, analyzing the dream, she figured Bruce, Bruce Springsteen was the boss. The boss of her psyche. The bus was the vehicle of her life. The boss was telling Carol it was time to take the wheel. More than that, the dream, by actually setting, down, setting her down in the driver's seat and letting her feel that she could control the vehicle on the road, was providing her with a simulator run to prime her with the confidence that she could actually take command in her life. A dream like that is real support. It's a check you can cash when you sit down alone to do your work. P.S. When your deeper self delivers a dream like that, don't talk about it. Don't dilute its power. The dream is for you. It's between you and your muse. Shut up and use it. The only exception is you may share it with another comrade in arms if sharing it will help or encourage that comrade in his or her own endeavors. Resistance and Rationalization Rationalization is resistance's right-hand man. Its job is to keep us from feeling the shame we would feel if we truly faced what cowards we are for not doing our work. Michael, don't knock rationaliz rationalization. Where would we be without it? I don't know anyone who can get through the day without two or three juicy rationalizations. They're more important than sex. Sam, oh, come on, nothing's more important than sex. Michael, oh yeah, have you ever gone a week without rationalization? And that was from Jeff Goldblum and Tom Berenger in Lawrence Kasdan's The Big Chill. But rationalization has its own sidekick. It's the part of our psyche that actually believes what rationalization, is, what rationalization tells us. It's one thing to lie to ourselves. It's another thing to believe it. Resistance and rationalization part two. Resistance is fear. But resistance is too cunning to show its itself naked in its form. Why? Because if resistance lets us see clearly that our own fear is preventing us from doing our work, we may feel shame at this, and shame may drive us to act in the face of fear. Resistance doesn't want us to do this, so it brings in rationalization. Rationalization is resistance's spin doctor. 
It's resistance's way of hiding the big stick behind its back. Instead of showing us our fear, which might shame us and impel us to, to do our work, resistance presents us with a series of plausible, rational justifications for why we shouldn't do our work. What's particularly insidious about the rationalizations that resistance presents to us is that a lot of them are true. They're legitimate. Our wife really may be in her eighth month of pregnancy. She may in truth need us at home. Our department may really be instituting a changeover that will eat up hours of our time. Indeed, it may make sense to put off finishing our dissertation at least till after our baby's born. What resistance leaves out, of course, is that, is that all this means diddly. Tolstoy had 13 kids and wrote War and Peace. Lance Armstrong had cancer and won the Tour de France three years and counting. Resistance can be beaten. If resistance couldn't be beaten, there would be no Fifth Symphony, no Romeo and Juliet, no Golden Gate Bridge. Defeating resistance is like giving birth. It seems absolutely impossible until you remember that women have been pulling it off successfully, with support and without, for 50 million years. That's the end of book one. Next time we're going to come into book two, Combating Resistance. We're going to start off with a quote from Telamon of Arcadia and then move into Professionals and Amateurs. Thank you for watching. I'll see you in the next one.